right, today we're going to go over um, the example that we worked through together um, in groups on Tuesday. Um, and then we'll go from there. Remember in lab, make sure you've turned it in, and then I will go around the room to grade everything in some order or another. for your lab threes. All right, here's the example that we had to do. And can someone describe what's wrong with this as it is? In other words, why couldn't we make a table in a relational database that looks just like this and just put this data in there? It's just flat data. It's just flat data, OK? That's true. Uh, and what's wrong with that? Yeah, more applications to install. All right. First of all, this limits you to three applications. What if there were more applications to store, to store rather, uh, installed on each machine? So that's that's one problem. What's another problem? Repetition. How so? It's, what was the second thing you said? Yeah. So, for example, the fact that BU is the business building is repeated over and over. And what's wrong with that? It's redundant. It's redundant. And what's wrong with that? More room for error. All right. Use up more space than necessary. And I guess along with air, there's a, the chance of inconsistency. All right. So um, if they were to change the name of the business building to honor me and make it the Mike Zeller's business <coughs> building, there would be a bunch of places that they'd have to change that in. Also, the room description is duplicated. So. Right now, 210 is the Cisco lab, 106 is the open lab. If they were to change 106 to be the Cisco lab and 210 to be the open lab, that could lead to all sorts of confusion and errors and so on. So that kind of summarizes it. All right, that kind of summarizes the issues with this. Um, in, in more using the, the, the jargon and the language of the field, it's not normalized, all right? To speak more informally, we haven't really, we've treated everything like it's one entity. We've said, okay, we have this computer. That's our entity. And here are all the characteristics of it. But really, we haven't identified all the entities in this problem. We're acting as though there's just one entity, the computer, when really there's several entities. And what we need to do is, first of all, split this into the appropriate entities, make sure we've defined the relationships between the entities, and finally make sure we have the attributes in the right place. For example, room description isn't going to belong with the computer. Why? Because room description is an attribute of the room. It's not an attribute of the computer. Likewise with building description, likewise with application name, and so on. So here's how I would do this. I would look and I would say, what entities do we actually have? What different things do we have? And again, Entities are typically person, place, or thing. You know, typically they correspond to what we would say are nouns. Everything in this problem is going to be an entity. It's going to be an attribute, or it's going to describe a relationship. All right. So, what entities do we have in this problem? What entities do we have in this problem? Buildings, rooms, applications, and computers. 
Okay? That's true. There's one more entity that we're going to have, that we have to have. Computer application. Because that will be the intersecting entity between computer and application. If it's not obvious why we have that, I hope we will. It will be obvious in a minute. So I'm going to start off drawing those four entities that we identified. that exist. Now, an example like this, it might be obvious, but keep in mind that some examples are not quite as obvious as this, and therefore you have to think this through. So we'll name a relationship that's up here, that should be up here. students and you had student info 
and you had a separate table for international students. That just has the information that is unique to international students, like what, what country they come from, what their visa is, and so on and so forth. So every student would have a row in this table, whether they're international or domestic. Only international students would have a row in this table because they're the only ones that have the visa and country of origin and so on. What's the alternative to doing it this way? <coughs> What's the alternative to creating a second table? putting everything in the student table. What's wrong with that? Domestic students would have a whole bunch of fields that didn't have any data in. That's one problem. Okay. I bumped it and I started up Angry Birds. just going to get upset and say you guys shouldn't have your phones on during class, but <laughs> uh, someone, one teacher I knew, every time someone's phone went off in class, there was a quiz. I don't know if the teacher's phone went off. Was there still a quiz? That would kind of be dirty if it was, but I don't know. But anyhow, you could put all of the international students' info in the student table. There'd be a lot of, of rows in that table that didn't have any values. Is that a problem? Yeah, a little bit of a problem. Maybe, maybe not. What's another problem with this? Maybe a little more subtle problem. It'd be problematic saying if those fields are required or not. In fact, because if everything was stored in there, those fields couldn't be required, right? If you had visa and visa expiration, and other information like that. All right, country of origin, yeah, you could, you could have that because everyone has a country of origin, whether they're an international student or not. All right, but what their visa is, what their visa expiration date, the type of visa they have, and so on. You couldn't make those required because domestic students didn't have those. Yet, if someone was identified as a foreign student, you would want them required. And that poses a problem. With this structure, you can make those fields as required fields in an international table and make sure that they're put in in the case of an international student. Here's a rule that we're going to go by. This is the first time we've talked about constraints where this is a good thing to bring up. But it's always better to implement a constraint in a database as opposed to within your application. Okay, Always better. If you have a choice to implement a restriction in your application or in the database implemented in your database. Yeah, that's why you implement the restrictions in the database and not in the application. That's even more reason. Let's say, for example, <coughs> let's just have a real simple example. Let's say there were There was a well, I think it went. let's say that there was putting the application name in is a required field. Remember all accessing of the database goes through a program called the DBMS, the Database Management System. So, if I had five applications, or three applications, a desktop version of the application, a web-based, and a mobile version of the application, that all allowed an administrator 
to enter new applications in, all right, into the database. So I have a web-based one, I have a mobile one, and I have a desktop version. And they're all set up to allow administrators to maintain this data, including applications. If I build the constraints in the database, that I only have to get the constraints right once, right? Because all of these have to go through the DBMS to actually hit the data. <clears throat> if, however, you don't implement the restriction here, it means you have to get it right three times. And there's more chance of getting it wrong. Maybe you, uh, maybe your desktop developer is great, your web developer is great, but your mobile web developer is kind of iffy. And they don't know uh, validation very well. So they neglected to put certain validation that's required in. Well, if that validation is not also in the database, you could get invalid, corrupt data in your, in your relational database. Now, does it hurt to have that, the, the validations in both places? No. So I can put the constraints in here, and I can still have validations in these places, like to make it a little more user-friendly, right? Um, a lot of times we have client-side validation in web applications where if the data isn't correct, we don't even try to submit it to the database to save everyone time and hassle. Yeah, I, yeah, I remember uh, in some websites, so when you try to sign up and you put in the username, it, it, sometimes it will not work because it some websites would say, like, all oh, this series of usernames already taken. Well, that would have to be server-side validation. That couldn't be client-side validation. Oh, yeah, but, but for an example. Okay. It's not really an example of what we're talking about here. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, the point is that you can still have, uh, you can still have validation in the applications, but make sure the restrictions are in the database, because if any of these then have an issue with something, then this is sort of the fail-safe. This will make sure that the data doesn't get in as corrupt. So that's why having an international student table in addition to a student table would be good. All right? And that would be, getting back to the original point, that would be an example of a one-to-one -one relationship in a database. One international student record would correspond to only one student record. It would be an optional one-to-one -one relationship because not every student is going to have an international student data. But the international students, it would be a one-to-one -one relationship. The other kind are when there's unique sort of business rules. Um, I guess, for example, if I had a, uh, if I was doing a database for the, for football, there would be a one-to-one -one relationship between head coach and team. All right. Um, now, again, not between coaches and team because the team has multiple coaches, but if you looked at head coach, I'm not aware of any situation ever where there's been like tag team uh, head coaches, where there's two head coaches. So there's always one. In an academic setting, maybe the relationship between deans and division. Each dean is responsible for one division. Each division has one dean. So that would be a one-to-one -one relationship. But as you can tell, it's almost hard to think of one-to-one -one examples, all right? Because as they go, they're fairly rare. And a lot of one-to-many relationships or a lot of things that maybe you'd think, well, how do I want to say this? A lot of things that maybe you would think would be a one-to-one -one relationship, when you drill down, uh, maybe are a different kind of relationship when you really think about it. Here's sort of a dumb one, but I, I, I think it, it serves the, the point. Relationship between person and automobile. You might say, yeah, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. You know, person has a car, car belongs to a person. Well, okay, but there are people who have more than one cars, right? And therefore... A one-to-one -one relationship is incorrect. Remember, if it happens, we want our database to be able to capture it. All right? 
So we're not looking at, how do I want to say, we're not looking at saying, well, 90% of people only have one car. Okay, but does that mean we want our database to not be able to work 10% of the time? No. Okay, so therefore, if we were building, so let's say, for car insurance, um, if we were building a database for car insurance, and we had automobiles and we had people, would we have a one-to-one -one relationship? No, because there are people that could have two automobiles, and we wouldn't want it to break in that case. Sometimes things that look like one-to-many relationships are actually many-to-many -many relationship. A good example of that would be the relationship between students and majors. All right? You might think one student has one major, but a given major can have multiple students. Well, there's students that have multiple majors as well. So you have to be very careful when you look at the, the cardinality of the relationships and say, hey, it's one to many, it's one to one, it's many to many. You really have to make sure you identify it correctly because a lot of cases they're pretty obvious, but in some cases you have to dig deeper. And remember, it's not enough to say, well, most of the time, well, we don't want our database to work most of the time. We want our database to work all the time. We want our design to be robust enough to handle all the real life situations. Now, that being said, one could make the argument for the international student thing that it's more trouble than it's worth to create another table. We'll just put everything into one table and we'll worry about the validation separately. We could do that. However, it should be like an informed decision. All right? It should be something that you say, I know theoretically it's better to do it this way, but I'm going to do it that way because I think that the complexity of having the extra table isn't worth the benefit that we get. All right? Okay. So, we, I was trying to, to persuade you that one-to-many relationships are the most common. We've gone through one-to-one -one relationships, and we found that those aren't very common. Okay? What about many-to-many -many relationships? Where is the many-to-many -many relationship here? Where is there a many-to-many -many relationship in our example? Between computer and applications. So how do we determine that? How do we determine that that's many to many? Well, we look and we have to go in both directions, right? We can't just go look at it in one direction. We have to look at the relationship going both from A to B and from B to A. So one computer can have how many applications on it? Well, of course it can have many, all right? A given application can be on how many computers? It can be on many. Therefore, it's many to many. You can't just look in one direction and say, well, computer has multiple applications, one to many. No, you got to go the reverse and say, one of these. So one of these has how many of these? One of these has how many of these? Now, in database, we're not interested in exact numbers when we do database design. If it's more than one, it's many. So like, for example, the relationship between students and majors. We're not going to say, well, yeah, there's some students that have more than one major, but just one or two majors. Well, and if you build the database with that in mind, there's always a possibility, well, there, here's an exceptional student, one of those 12-year-old 12, 12 prodigies that's uh, majoring in violin, medicine, and nuclear physics. Sorry, you can't come to our college because our database doesn't accommodate it. You know? So... If it's, if it's more than one, it's many, all right? So we're not going to say students can have more than one major, but it's usually only like one or two. Nope, it's not one, therefore it's many. All right, let's look at the other relationships. Oh, no, we're not done with many-to-many. -many. Now, here's the thing about many-to-many -many relationships. They can't stand. They can't stay in that form. 
when you actually implement them in a relational database. Now when I draw them on a diagram, I can do that, right? Because I can draw anything, right? But when I actually try to implement them in the database, there's a problem, all right? Here's the problem. Where do you put the foreign key? Now, I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself. We haven't talked about foreign keys yet, although I suspect you all kind of have an idea of what they are. Do I put the foreign key for computers in the application table? Or I, do I put the application data in the computer table? Do I have more than one application in the computer table? How do I set that up? Well, the answer is, is there's no good way to set that up without introducing another table. So if you see a many to many, yes? Uh, I know it's not the ideal solution, but... It, then it's not the solution we're going to discuss. Okay, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, like, what I'm about to say is not the ideal, the ideal solution. It's like uh, putting in a, an array of different computers No. Nope. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's not, it's not ideal. Yeah, then why bring it up? Just yeah. it out there. There's a lot of things we could do. We could put a million spaces in computers to have a million possible applications because no computer has a million applications. But it's wrong. So why bring it up? All right? We could only store three applications. If they have four, well, we don't worry about them. That's wrong. So we don't need to bring up things that are substandard or, or that, that just don't work. You know, there's a lot of things, there's, there's probably more things that don't work than do work. So our focus is to focus on things that work. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to create an intersecting entity. We're going to create a table between those. And typically, that table has the name of the two other tables. Not always. You can have a case where it doesn't, but, you know. So the table that we're going to create is called computer application. All right? And it is going to go between these two tables. And it's going to have a one-to-many relationship with each of these tables. So, a one-to-many coming in this way and a one-to-many coming in that way. Now, we'll talk more about this when we define the attributes. All right? So, I don't think we're ready to define all the attributes yet. Okay. So we have two more relationships to consider. What are the cardinality of those? A building can have many rooms, but yeah. a room can only be in one building. A building can have many rooms. I've never ever seen a room that's been in more than one building. At least not on college. So, or at least not in the in realities we know it. One building can have many rooms. A given room is in one building. Again, we go both directions. All right? Room and computers. A room can have how many computers? Many. Each computer is in how many rooms? One. Okay? So, that's the relationships between these. Now, let's start putting attributes in this, guys. Now, there's a special attribute called the primary key. All right? Every table has to have a primary key. The primary key uniquely identifies rows in that table, members of that entity. Unique means only one. People in general conversation misuse the word. They, they might say, this guy has a unique 
ability to play the violin and hula hoop at the same time. Is that really unique? Is he the only person that can do that? No, there probably are other people. So they really mean rare, all right? Unique literally means there's only one, all right? So if there's only one person that can hula hoop and play violin, yeah, they're unique. But if there's more than one, they're rare, all right? So for example, why does this come up? Let's say email addresses, all right? Could we make an email address as a primary key in a table of customers? Probably not, all right? Why? Well, and it's funny, you see this usually with, and I can, I, I can, I can, poke a little bit of general fun at this group because I'm a member of it, all right? But generally with older people, you will see a Facebook group for like Marty and Susan, so and so. You'll see a Facebook uh, profile for that. And sometimes those people have like shared email addresses, you know, go figure. So we couldn't consider that because if they both enrolled in our school or if they both wanted to be a customer for our organization, they would have, they couldn't use that because two people share that email account. The other possibility and the other restriction on an email, uh, not on an email, but on a primary key, is that it must, uh, it must, is required for every member of that entity to have one. So, if we had customers for, um, and, 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 and there was a possibility that we had a customer that would not have an email account, we couldn't use that, all right, or telephone number or whatever. Now, do people do that? Yeah, they make that restriction and say, no, got to have an email account to use this, use this site, which, again, probably is not that severe of a restriction, but if you really thought there were customers that did not have an email account, you couldn't use that as a primary key. All right, so uniquely identifies. Here's another thing about a primary key. It has to be minimal. What does that mean, <clears throat> a primary key being minimal? Well. Let's look at the building. What are the two attributes that uh, appear in the building? Building table. Building code. And building name. And a description. Okay. Building code, building name, building description. Could I make these two columns together the primary key? Do both do both things have them? Do, do, does every does every member of the entity have that those values for the fields? Yes. Every building on campus has a code and it has a name. All right. Is it unique? Absolutely. There is no other building on campus that is BU business building. So it seems to pass those first two rules for primary key. It doesn't pass the minimal rule. What is the minimal rule? What's another way of saying the minimal rule? Why can't this be the primary key? What should be the primary key? Just the building code. In other words, the building code's enough to make it unique. So you don't combine the building code with anything else because the building code in itself is sufficient. So if I tried to make the building code and description the primary key, that's not minimal because the building code by itself is enough to be the primary key. And there could be problems with that. What would the problems of that be? Someone could type in BU business building. Someone could type in BU, BUS period building. All right. 
and then you'd have two buildings that look like they were different buildings when actually they're the same. <coughs> Building name. <coughs> Is that also going to be unique on, on campus? Think of any campus that you've ever seen. Has there been more than one business building? with the exact same name business building? No, probably not. What do you do when you have a situation where we have another field? So we decided this is a good primary key, right? It follows the rules. It's unique. No two buildings have the same code. Everyone has one. Every building has one, all right? But also we have this building name, all right, building name, that also is unique. We've already said a minute ago that we would not make that part of the primary key because it's, it, it's not a minimal primary key. Could we then make the business, the building name the primary key? Make the building code the pro, uh, not a primary key? Yeah, we could. Why would we probably not do that? Building code is shorter. Building code shorter, which, <clears throat> which means that you're going to save space, not just in, in this table, but in every table that's related to that. Because we're gonna, the, what, if you think ahead, we're going to be using this building code for each room. So if we store business to a business building for each room, that's taking up X number of characters. If we use BU as a building code where we have a lot less characters. So, what are other guidelines? Shorter? Is it better to use a number or a string? A number is typically going to be shorter as well. But we still have our building name. We still have the problem that our building name is unique. All right. <clears throat> now, based on what I said over there, that <clears throat> we could <coughs> do validation in our applications to make sure no one entered in a duplicate building name. But what did we say about that? We said that that's not a good idea, right? At least that's not a good idea to only do validation in the applications. We want to implement the constraints in the database wherever we can. How can we make a field that's not the primary key unique? Set the field to no duplicates? You're, you're, you're like 90% right, but you do something first. You define a unique index on it. You define an index on the field, and then you say the index is unique. Think of an index as being an alternative way of looking up a piece of information. All right? So, in the student table, the primary key might be student ID. It's real easy to look up stuff by student ID because it's the primary key. There's indexes in the database that will find a student like that. But of course there might be students that forget their ID, right? Or don't, you know, don't remember what their ID number is. So you might have a second way to look them up. Maybe by name. Maybe by phone number. Now, some of those other in, some of those quick ways of looking them up or another name for a quick way to looking it up would be to create a database index for it. So you can look up by name, you can look up by phone number, whatever. Now, there's going to be duplicate and not duplicate indexes. For example, name. It's not going to, or it's going to allow duplicates, right? Because there could be two people with the same name, right? Phone number probably would be not unique also because there could be people that share a phone, you know, live and have a landline or something like that. But if we had 
social security number, which I know is probably a privacy violation, but let's forget about that for a second. Social security number, everyone should have one, and they should all be unique. Um, therefore, I, I would make that a unique index. So, for building name, it's probably a unique index. All right. Building name would be an example of what's called a candidate key. A candidate key is something that could be the primary key, but you chose something else instead, for whatever reason. <clears throat> you could choose something because, in this case, it's the, the building code was shorter. Or maybe you would choose a number instead of uh, a characters or whatever. Candidate keys we're going to make unique indexes for. All right. Another thing we have to define is we have to define size, we have to define data type, and we have to define whether this is required. I'm assuming all these are going to be strings. The building name, I don't know, 20 characters maybe? I'd, I'd figure out the biggest name on campus and I'd add so many extra characters. Um, and whether or not they're required. Building description, I probably would make required. All right. Again, I'm going to implement all these constraints in the database. And when, so when you're designing the database, don't just go through and define the big constraints like the primary keys and foreign keys. Go through and define whether the field is required, the kind of data it takes, and so on. Now, I wouldn't make the building description, I would not make a unique index. Because I could conceivably have um, two buildings that served about the same purpose. I could have work sheds, for example, if you count those as buildings. I could have those on campus. I could have, um, you know, depending on how refined I want to make the description, I could have buildings that contained offices versus buildings that had classrooms versus buildings that had labs. So I'm probably not going to worry about the description being unique, but I probably will make it required. Okay, room. <clears throat> what are the attributes that we're going to have in room? Pardon me? Okay, you have a room ID. Probably. 
probably would care about it because for auditing purposes, you want to account for all your checks. But in something like this, if my room numbers went one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, no one's going to really say what happened to room four. You know, there's no real problem for that. Now, so this, any idea what kind of key this is called? The auto number. You said a couple terms for it. There's another more general term. It's sometimes called a surrogate key. All right? Now, surrogate keys are opposed to natural keys. What's a natural key? Well, if we use the room number and the building code, that would be a natural key. So, for example, our lab, BU... What are we in? 202? If we use the building code and a room number, that would be a potential for a key, right? Because every room has a building it's in, and every room has a number associated with it. So it could be primary key, and there's no duplicates. There's no two BU202s or BU205s or whatever. There's only one. So every row has, has that combination of fields. And it's unique. <coughs> so it's a candidate to be a key. All right? It is, yeah, go ahead. It, it's, also, it's also possible to make both the room number and building code of the primary keys. Yep, yeah, that's, that's what we're discussing, oh. making both of those together. We obviously couldn't make just one of them, right? Yeah. That's because a, that's a, that Exactly. So it has to be the combination. Now, BU202, if we selected that, that would be called a natural key. Why? Because BU202 means something outside our database. All right? I could send someone, go to BU202, and they could find the BU building, because that's what they call this building. That's what everyone calls this building. Not just in the database, but in real life. This is called the BU building, and 202 is plastered on the wall, all right? So we know that that BU202 actually means something in the real world. So that's what's called a natural key. Um, the room ID, which is just assigned a number, is called a surrogate key because it's sort of the opposite of a natural key. It doesn't mean anything in the real world. If I were to tell you go to room one, what does that mean? I don't know. Which room is room one? Well, the room that someone happened to put first in when they were entering the list of rooms. How do I know that? You don't. All right? It's not going to be displayed on the wall. It isn't really useful for humans. But it does serve a use in the database. So... You have a choice when you create tables. You could always generate a surrogate key if you wanted to. We could have done that with um, the building table. We don't have to make the building code the primary key. We could make a building number or a building ID and just make the first building building one, the second building building two, and so on down the line. So for any table, you could use a generated surrogate key. Some of that, you, you can see people argue this up, down, and sideways, which is a better approach. I like using surrogate keys, so I typically would use a generated key. The thing to keep in mind, though, is if you make this the primary key, then this is a candidate key. And what do we do with candidate keys? Make, it index. make, a, make an index and make a unique index. Uh, so if you go and make this the primary key, that's cool, but make sure you make this a surrogate key. Oh, I'm sorry, a, a unique index. Now, that's going to affect how we store a foreign key in the computers, right? Because if we use the surrogate key, all we have to do is say, put the room ID in the computers. 
Our other option would have the room number and the building code together as a primary key. And then we would have to store that as a foreign key in there. We'd have to store both fields. That's one of the reasons I tend to prefer surrogate keys. They're easier, just one part keys, always. All right, computer table. We have a computer ID. And I think that's all I defined in that. Pardon me? Oh, your purchase. So computer ID, year purchased. We would almost definitely have other fields in here, like uh, the, the make and the model and, and uh, uh, other information, maybe about the hardware, what kind of processor it has, and so on and so forth. Um, we would probably have that. Uh, in that table as well. Uh, we might have like a serial number, which could be a primary key, but again, serial numbers are typically long, surrogate keys are typically short. So I'm going to use the surrogate key again as that, uh, and so on. If you do have a candidate key, remember make it a unique index. Now, for foreign keys. For foreign keys, it depends whether we take this approach or this approach. If we took this approach, we'd have to put both these fields up here as a foreign key. If we pick just the room ID, then we just have the room ID. So sort of the alternate version would be to have the room number and the building code. Applications, I think all we have is the application code. And the description or the name, primary key. Again, we could put a surrogate key on here if we wanted to. It's not like you have to use all surrogate keys or all natural keys. You can mix and match, do whatever you want. It's your database. And then in the intersecting table, you will have the primary keys of each of these tables. We'll form the primary key of this table and will also be foreign keys over to their respective tables. <clears throat> will there ever be a reason for there to be more than the key in that intersecting table? Like I have Right now, all I have in that intersecting table is computer ID and um, application code. Would there ever be a need to have other fields, fields that maybe didn't relate to the key? Maybe, uh, maybe an application version? Maybe, although probably the better thing to do would be to have separate info in the app table to do that. Or have an app table and an app version table. Is there ever a case to put other fields in that table? Maybe not this specific one, but other intersecting tables. You know, if I ask if there's ever a case, the answer is probably going to be yes. All right, so the question is, is what instance would you have that? It would be something that related to that specific combination of things. So maybe we could put the date that the application was installed in there. All right? Again, following the normalization rules, and we haven't mentioned any of the normalization rules, but we have used them in the back of our mind because the idea of the normalization rules is that we've identified all the entities, which we have, we create the relationships, which we have. We associate the attributes with the entities, which we have. And when we're done, every attribute only depends on the primary key. All right? 
every attribute only depends on the entire primary key and on nothing else. So, what would be breaking those rules? If I put the building name in here. Because building does have a different name depending on what computer you're sitting at. This is a business building. No matter what computer you're sitting at in a business building. So that doesn't depend on the computer, that depends on the building. So that would violate the normalization rules. If I put the application name here, that files, violates the rule because the application name only depends on the particular app code. And therefore all we need is the app code in there. Let's say we have a, uh, let's say we put the building name in here. Again, the building name doesn't depend on the room. If we're in this room, we don't call it the business building. If we're in another room, we call it some other building. It's always a business building. It doesn't depend on which room we're in in the business building. So if we look at this table now, if I put date installed, that is valid because not every computer got Word installed the same day. All right, and Word, uh, not every computer, and not every application on a particular computer got installed the same day. So if you want to know the date something was installed, you have to know what computer you're talking about and what application. So it does depend on the whole primary key. It's not enough to say, well, it's Word. Okay, everything for Word was installed on this day. No. Depends on what computer you're talking about. And likewise, I have this computer. What day were the applications installed? Well, which application are you talking about? It depends on the specific application that you're talking about. So therefore, the date that it was installed uh, uh, depends on um, the combination of the computer and the app code. Okay. Uh, next week... My aim is to do a little bit more database review, and possibly, I have to look at the schedule and time things out, possibly look at how we can start putting stuff from a database on our Razor pages. All right, uh, that's all I had for today.